Good morning, Vineyard. You guys doing all right? All right, you guys awake? Feel good? Yeah. Feel good? Yeah, I am. They're awake. Are you guys awake? You feel good over here? Okay, so we're about 35%. Hopefully by the time we get to worship, we're awake. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. My name is Cameron Clark. I'm on staff here at the church. Yeah. So great to be with you all this morning. I do want to take just a quick second and say, if this is your first time here with us this weekend, we are just so glad that you chose Vineyard to be your home church this weekend. I do want to take this opportunity to share something with you. If you are new, you received this program just a few moments ago. If you have any questions about who we are as a church, some things that we do around here at the church, event-wise and such like that, even uh, as far as like what you can expect as we progress through the service, all of that can be found right in this. So I would definitely encourage you to take advantage of this, especially if you're new. On the back later, you can actually fill in some notes. Uh, we have some fill in the blanks for that, so you can take advantage of that as well. Uh, so we're about to move into a time of worship, but before we move into that time of worship, uh, first thing I want you all to do is I want you all to stand with me. And then I want to share something with you uh, that I was reading yesterday. Um, in my Bible time yesterday, I came across this passage in the book of Lamentations, and um, I don't know, it just kind of reminded me of something. Sometimes this happens. Uh, you know, it's January, it's the beginning of the year. A lot of us have these New Year's resolutions uh, some of us have already failed our New Year's resolutions, like me, and that's okay. That's okay, no shame. Um, but one of the reasons why we have these New Year's resolutions is because we want to fix something, we want to correct something, something wasn't right before, and we say, you know what, I kind of want to reset, I kind of want to restart. And, and, you know, it got me thinking after I read this passage that, you know, one of the, my favorite things about the God that we serve, our Heavenly Father, is that He doesn't need a reset. His, his love doesn't need a restart. It's, it, it's never ending. It's, it's always perfect. In fact, it says this in Lamentations chapter 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You know, that's so great because that's the God that we're about to spend some time worshiping. A God who doesn't need a restart, a God who doesn't need a reset, a God who's, whose love for all of us is never ending, it never ceases. So let's pray and then let's go to the Lord in some worship, all right? So God, we thank you for this time that we have to lift your name up, to sing your praises, to sing our thanks to you for who you are. Father, we ask that in this time that you be with us, you open up our hearts, our minds to receive, Father. Uh, what you want to share with us. But at the same time, Father, we ask that this time, we, our hope and our prayers at this time is, is uh, it, it brings a smile to your face and it's honoring to you that when you look down at your sons and your daughters, you start to smile. Father, we just, uh, yeah, we just give you this time. I want to pray for Leah and the entire worship team as they prepare their hearts and their minds to lead us into an experience with you. So Father, we love you. We thank you. To your name we pray. Amen.
to God a sacrifice of praise. I'm going to read it one more time since it's really quick. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And here's the thought. A sacrifice is going to cost us something. A sacrifice of praise should cost us something for Jesus. And so my question for us all this morning is what are we going to do in the next two minutes that's going to cost us something for him? Your sacrifice of praise could look like you giving your comfort up for Jesus. Like maybe it's uncomfortable for you to stand right next to someone and sing out loud. Maybe your sacrifice of praise is going to cost you your energy. Like this morning, you are dragging and you're tired, but you're going to decide to put forth some energy to honor God and to worship him. And the last thing I thought of is maybe your sacrifice of praise is going to cost you your pride. Like maybe God's going to ask you to do something that you've never done before in worship. Maybe raise your hand or kneel, and it's going to be kind of scary, and someone might think you look a little weird, but you're going to do it because you love Jesus. And so I don't know what your sacrifice of praise looks like this morning, but I do know that Jesus sacrificed everything for us. And right now, we have an opportunity to love him back, to give him something this morning. So if you would stand, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship. So Jesus, we, we just acknowledge your sacrifice in this moment. You have given everything for us. You are so worthy of our praise, and it's our honor, it's our privilege to continue worshiping you today. So let's sing this together, sing day and night.
that's our prayer this morning. As we, as we lift up your praise, as we declare your honor and your glory, Father, we sing you are worthy. You're worthy of all of our praise. You're worthy of all of our sacrifice, Father. Whatever is, is hindering us from experiencing you in a fresh way, anything that's holding us back, um, Father, that we're placing on the throne of our hearts, Father, we remove that in this moment and place you at your rightful spot at the throne of our heart. Father, your love, as we were speaking of earlier, your love is never ending, it's never ceasing. It's for us, it's with us, it guides us. We, we, we say thank you for that. Thank you for your love. Father, as always, we hope that in this time of worship that it brought a smile to your face, that you felt loved and you felt honored. This is all for you. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hey, can we, can we give the worship team a shout? Yeah. They do such a great job leading us. Yes. Awesome. Hey, uh, middle schoolers, you're dismissed to your core class in the chapel. Everyone else, take the next 45 seconds or so and greet the people around you. Stevenson. I am on staff here at the church. Thank you. It's so, so good to be with you all this morning. If you're new with us today, we're really glad you're here. We hope you have a great experience. And if you'd stop by the Welcome Center in the atrium before you leave, we have a gift bag for you. So there's some information in there about the church, a free gift, and some chocolate. So don't miss out on that. And one of the best ways for you to get connected here at the Vineyard is by filling out the orange connect card that you'll find in the seat in front of you. If you haven't done that yet, simply grab the card, fill in the information, and you can turn it in at the Welcome Center after service. Or if you'd rather do it on your phone, you can text the word welcome to the number on the screen, and that number is also in your program. And if you'll grab your program, there's more going on at the church than we can share from the stage. But I do want to highlight two things. So number one, the first men's morning fuel of the year is coming soon. All right, that was, that was a little weak, but we'll take it. So men, this might be the only time you hear about it. So we're going to do something crazy, okay? You can sign up right now like today, so that you don't forget. Does that not, okay. I guess you all have incredible memories. That's great. So guys, don't forget to sign up for Men's Morning Fuel. We are also launching this semester's classes and workshops uh, this weekend with a launch party after the last service. So we have a launch party at 1245 in the chapel. And you may not know what that means, and that's okay. But basically, you're just invited to check out some of the classes and workshops that we offer here at the church. So there's going to be some food um, and some discussion and you might be thinking, how would I benefit from a class? Like, what does that even look like in my life? And that's okay. But we have found that the more we know about somebody significantly impacts our capacity to love them. Like, you might know that just in your everyday relationships. So the same is true in our relationship with God. The more we understand God's heart the easier it is to enjoy time with him. And as with a lot of things in life, it's more fun to do with other people who are on the same journey as you are. So that's what you will find in classes here at the church. So in your program this week, on the right-hand side where it says upcoming events, there are so many details on classes starting over the next few weeks. So some of those include how to get more from your Bible time, definitely important, how to hear God at work, that's from Pastor Steve, 
in a brand new class on Sunday mornings called Bringing God Home, which will be a great companion to the message series we are starting today. So the challenge is to get signed up for a class. There's actually going to be a booth in the atrium after this service where you can learn more about those classes, or you're welcome to come back after the last service for the launch party. But just get some details and jump into one of those classes. We are now about to move into the message, so at this time, we'd ask that you set your cell phones on silent. If you've kept a child in the service with you, that's totally fine. Though if we become restless, we do just ask that you take them out into the atrium, where you can still watch and listen to the message by the fireplace. And as for an offering, we don't pass the plate here at the vineyard, but giving is a really important way that we worship Jesus. So there are offering boxes in the back of the auditorium, as well as throughout the building. Or if easier, you can find other ways to give online at thevineyard.org slash give. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. My name's Mark Pope. I'm the lead pastor at the church. Nice to be with you today. That's nice of you. Also want to say hi to the Grape Road folks. Hope things are going well at the Grape Road location. A couple things for me before we get into the talk. Uh, First, before we pray for the offering, just a reminder that um, honoring God financially is really a great way to uh, worship Him. And it's a new year. And so, uh, why not, it's a newer year, what are we, 10, 11 days in, I don't even, what's the date today? Thank you, 12 days into it. Uh, And so, uh, how about we honor God with our finances, get started this year and do that well, it's an important thing to do. One of the great ways we can show Him that we love Him and and practically it moves ministry forward. Let's pause and pray about the offering. Father, as a bunch of us will either continue to be faithful in giving or some might start engaging uh, this year, as we do that, we hope that you feel loved and honored. And as usual, I pray that you would give us as a church, uh, myself or any of the other leaders or anyone that's making a financial decision for the church, will you help us to make the right decision every time? We really want to be great stewards of your money so that the most ministry can happen. So we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. One other thing, be watching for an email, uh, or if you're a Team Vineyard member, you probably already received one, to a link, uh, a 15-minute talk that I put together on the state of the church. Sometimes we take a whole weekend to talk about where we're headed this year. But we're trying it differently this year, so it's 15 minutes, uh, and uh, it's going to give you some insight into some of the things we're going to pay special attention to this year. So whether this is your church home, or if you're just visiting and thinking, I wonder if this should be my church home, this will be very important. Uh, So you'll get a link, or you can go to the vineyard.info, and it comes up right away. Just a heads up. This year, some things we're going to pay attention to is we're going to make sure we're trying to build resilient Christians, not just folks that kind of hang around Jesus for a day and a half and then go, "Ah, I don't know, okay? It's a deal. Uh, We're going to continue to think generationally, and one of the things that I am uh, very excited about is it feels like God is uh, leading us into having a greater impact on our cities and our communities around us. Can I give you for example? Thanks, three of you care. Um, so, for example, we just got a call this last week from one of the uh, directors at one of the hospitals, and they need a place to gather their staff. Uh, and uh, we're gonna, they're going to come to the vineyard. They want to go off-site. And so they're going to be uh, in the, they're gonna meet in the chapel, and we're going to serve them in that way. And I'm going to get a chance to just welcome them and, and, and do 10 minutes of something. So who knows what I'll do, but hopefully it'll be, hopefully it won't stink and be stupid. But it, does that make sense? Like, and we, we are just seeing, I got to start moving on because this is not about the talk. But what we're seeing is these connections and opportunities to serve our cities 
well. So, all right, watch the video, State of the Church. Today we're going to be in John chapter 17, and I want to get started and tell you a little bit with a story about my brother. My brother's name is Ryan. He's a little bit older than I am. This will be relevant. Uh, here's a picture of my, my brother and his family. Of course, he's, he's the guy. Okay, so it's a brother there, baseball cap. Um, what, do, what do I want to say about uh, Ryan? He's a little bit older than I am. He uh, is, he's actually in a, uh, I think, a spiritual growth spurt. He's been a Christian for quite some time, but he just seems to be in this season of growing as a Christian. The other thing about him is he's a car guy. So he's got several, like, antique and classic cars. He's a, here's a picture. He is also the, pre he just took over a position as the president of the El Paso, I don't know the title, the El Paso Car Club for guys and gals that own Hudson Classic Antique Cars, something like that. That's a really long title. That's not the right title. So he's that, can you kind of picture he's that kind of a guy and all that, that stuff. Well, here's why I'm talking about my brother. About a month ago, as the Christmas season was approaching, one of his other car people friends, we'll just call him Ned because I don't know his name, because my brother was telling me the story. So Ned was talking about Christmas, and they were dialoguing, I think, about a holiday party, a Christmas party. And Ned kept referring to Christmas with an X, you know, Xmas. And so my brother, who's kind of on this spiritual growth spurt, interjected into the conversation with the guy we're calling Ned and said, Ned, somehow, I don't know exactly, he said, he said I just said, Ned. So, so he said, it's about Jesus. And it's called Christmas. So it was, you know, like getting a little God in there. And so then here's what happened. So Ned, we don't know his motivation, but apparently maybe Ned was like, okay, Mr. Christian, Christian, Christian. Because when the holiday party happened, Ned called out my brother and said, well, when the people were gathering to eat, and he basically said to my brother, yeah, Ryan, hey, why don't you pray before we eat at the car club party. And just so you know, I don't think the prayer at the car club thing was a normal. Like, that's not what they do in El Paso. No, I, it wasn't about it. Does that make sense? So, and the, the point, my brother was telling me about being on the spot and praying out loud in front of all these people, and he was like scared and excited, and so I, he was talking, and I could tell he was like, I don't know what to do. Have you ever been there? We're like someone, in fact, does anybody want to be there now? How many of you have never prayed out loud in front of anyone? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to call on someone. See? <laughs> no. Some of you are like, wait, whoa. So he had that feeling, but he prayed, and uh, by the end of the story, I just was telling him, man, that was awesome. That's a great prayer. He was like, I don't know if I did very well. That was a great prayer. Way to go. And what I was excited about and, and just encouraged was that he was taking his faith and he was applying it and, 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 and participating in it in the real world. Right? Just in the real world world. I still remember the first time someone asked me to pray out loud in public. I don't think I'll ever forget because it was intense and scary, and, but I'm glad I did. Let me tell you another potentially defining moment for me uh, when my belief in Jesus and my decision to say I'm a Christian impacted a real world experience. Now, just a warning, part of this story, I'm going to use the word sex. Now, some of you just started to pay attention. <laughs> wait, wait, did he just say, yeah, okay. So anyway, I, was, I became a Christian when I was 20. And before I was a Christian, I wasn't a Christian. Some of you don't get that. Um, so at this point, I'm probably 20, 21 years old. And I was in a serious spiritual growth spurt. And I was at a park, and I was hanging out, and I was in a casual conversation with a young lady that I had just met. A couple things about the conversation. It was a fairly flirty conversation. I think she was flirting with me. She must have been challenged in some way. But she was, um, 
flirting with me. And here's the other thing. She was really uh, attractive. So we were talking, and, and uh, I, because I had become a Christian, I started talking about God, and, and I, you know, told her, I don't remember the specifics, this part, but, I, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I became a Christian, and this and that, and uh, at that point, I was serving heavily in a church and leading some things in a church. And uh, when I started to talk this much about God and uh, the fact that I was uh, a leader at a church, she stopped the conversation and she said this. She said, so, like, does this mean that you don't have sex? <laughs> now, she didn't do that. But, but it was like that. Thing. And you know what happened to me at 21 years old when that, when somebody said, my brain started going, <laughs> I was like this crazy thing. And I, but I still remember, and I think God was just with me and jumped into the conversation because I still remember this very specifically. And in the midst of, I went, and I settled in, and I went, yeah, that's what that means. And it was a defining moment for me because I was, gonna de I was deciding my walk with God is going to affect my everyday life. Does that make sense? So that, to bring up a question... For us all, how am I doing at Christianity in everyday life? Ask yourself that. How am I doing? Most of Christianity is not about what's going on here in this hour we call church, you guys. And just to be clear, God's master plan 2,000 years ago when he sent Jesus into the world, right? Jesus, I'm going to send you into the world, and you're going to be born of a virgin. You're going to endure 30 years in a very imperfect world, but you're going to be perfect, sinless the whole time. You're going to eat, do all that. Then you're going to go through three years of very ministry that's going to make you so tired that you can't even believe it. There's so many times where Jesus was just tired, tired, and engaged, and it was difficult. And then at the end of that ministry, he was going to get the snot kicked out of him, beaten up, finally hung on a cross, die. He's going to be dead for three days, raised from the grave. God's entire plan to put Jesus through all that was not just because God looked down from heaven and thought, I want some people who will take an hour a week and go to church. That's not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In Deuteronomy, I think it's 6.5, 6.7. Um, it's talking about passing the faith, the understanding of Jesus, the relationship with God, or with, with God our Father. It's talking about passing that on to your children and the commands of God. And it says, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. It's the reality. It's not just to talk about them when you're at church. Give you one more in John 14, 17. Jesus is teaching about the Holy Spirit. It says to the followers of Jesus, you know him. He will be with you and will be in you. And that's not just a visitation. Like he'll visit you every once in a while. He's going to live in us as Christians all the time. Now, that's good news if you're like me because I need God in all of my life. Not just the, the churchy stuff. I was thinking of some of the things that I'm walking through now in my life, and I'm still struggling just a little bit with my, uh, my mom passed away uh, six months ago. That's a thing. My wife and I are trying to figure out how to be empty nesters. My son's going to get married in two months. We've been trying to replace a vehicle. 
on limited income with other vehicle, and it's just been this thing. It's been trying. I think we got it finished, but it's been a thing. Uh, yeah, uh, Saturday morning, yesterday, a young man officially asked me if he could date my youngest daughter. I said no. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. As a joke. But that's going on. I got somewhere between four and five New Year's resolutions that I'm trying to figure out because it's a new year. You know what? Here's the deal. All of that stuff is happening in the real world. That's not here. This is the easy part. Great, bro. Like, getting to, church is the easy part. I have not been flipped off one time in the last hour. Really? And y'all are nice. Like, hear you say hi. They say hi. Like, this is the easy part. I right now, my temptation level is really low right now because we're all, it's out there that we need God and should be engaging with God. Okay, so hold that. Hold those thoughts. We're kicking off a series called The 167. And that is a reference to the 167 hours a week we're not doing church for an hour. There are 168 hours in every week. We're going to talk about the 167. How do you be a Christian? How do you connect with God? How do you have the Holy Spirit's power in your life out there? And uh, we're going to talk about things like having God in the midst of work and our uh, professional responsibilities and romance and our leisure time. And we're going to kick it off with what I've decided is our theme verse, one verse out of John 17, where Jesus is praying for the disciples. So this is a prayer for us, if you're a follower of Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, my prayer is not, this is a prayer to the Father. He's talking to God, the Father. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And I've got two principles to kick off the series on how it's going to help us be Christians in the real world, all right? So before we uh, write a few things down and think about them, some things, would you stand with me? We're going to pray, not just about today, great probe, stand, not just about today, but about the next, like, six weeks. So let's pray. Father, some of us have been trying hard to do this for a long time. Some of us... This will be a new, a phenomenal new season where you'll be closer than ever. In all of it, this is just one prayer of big invitation. We want you in our lives in every aspect. Please increase that over the next six weeks, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Get ready to write a couple things down. The first thing I want to talk about is a key to the Christian life in the real world, and the first one is this. Christian life in the real world requires settling in, I'm sorry, into our present situations. I don't know if that's a great way to say it, but it really caught my attention in the first half of the verse. Jesus' prayer was not that you take them out of the world. Like it, and that was a little bit surprising to me because I tend to think, sometimes I think we think, well, if Jesus had his way in the midst of all that world stuff, like Jesus would say, oh, no, get out of that. But he said, no, Father, I'm, don't pray. I'm praying that don't take them out of the world. Now, it helps a little bit to know this, uh, what the, the word world means in this text. There's a couple different words for world or worldly things. Uh, in, in the original language. Sometimes it means world, and it's the carnal or the worst part of the, it's the fleshy part of the world, the temptation. This word is more of a broad word. It's cosmos, and it's, it's the ordered systems of the world. And it's not far from, like, just the stuff that we all have to do every day it's the system of you got to get up and you have to eat and then you, most of us, you know, have jobs and we have to take care of our finances and we're in relation. It's, it's that designed system. And Jesus says, I'm not asking you, Father, that you take them out of that stuff. And that was a little surprising to me because sometimes I have thought 
I guess maybe wrongly, that Jesus doesn't care about that stuff. What does Jesus care about? He cares about mission trips. Right? That's what Jesus cares. If you want to talk to God about something, talk to him about a mission trip. Or he, he cares about praying. Or he cares about singing songs to him. He, prays a prayer. he cares about offerings. He cares about, well, maybe sometimes he cares if, it, if your situation's really difficult. Or if, if you, he cares about the poor. He cares about that. But what I want to say, the truth is, God also cares about lunch. The story in Matthew where they ran out of food and people were hungry. So what does he do? He does this whole miracle thing, arguably for lunch. He cares about lunch. He uh, cares about uh, romantic relationships. In a few weeks, I'm going to do a talk on, like, God in the midst of romance and dating and that stuff. He cares about that. There are multiple teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about marriage. There are over 2,000 verses in the Bible that talk about finances. He cares about that stuff. He cares about legal things. In Matthew 5, 25, he says, Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. He goes on to talk about a judge, and if you read farther in the verse, he talks about a, a, a police officer and jail, and he cares about those things. If you have not thought about this, most of Jesus' miracles and teachings were outside of the synagogue. Most He did some things in the synagogue. Most of it was out on a mountainside, or when he's walking down a road, or it's out there in the real world. Um, just a little theology for you. I remember back in a, uh, I took a couple seminary classes, did some Bible college stuff. And I remember when they were teaching us that the Western mindset typically separates the spiritual life from the physical life. That's kind of how we have been taught. And so, and we do this a lot. We say, well, how are you doing spiritually? And we would separate that out from how you're doing, you know, physically. But in the Hebrew mind and in, in biblical thinking, there is not a separation between those two. Life is not your spiritual life and your 167 hours a week. Life is just life. Does that make sense? So that can be really helpful, and especially when we talk about engaging with God and Him being engaged with us all the time. There is no difference. It's all just life. When Jesus came, and if you've heard the term salvation, people talk about Jesus came to bring salvation to us. He didn't come to bring us spiritual salvation separate from physical salvation. He came to bring salvation, which is for all of life and in, in His thinking in mind. It's just all the same thing. Why am I doing this? I don't know, but it's an illustration to together. <laughs> Here, you can write this in. Because God wants to be involved in all of it. Jesus prayed, leave us in the world because he plans to be involved in the world. Our world. That's the point. In Psalm 139, it's a great psalm, and it talks about God and says that he is familiar with all my ways, all of your ways. Let me try to interject a practical thing that you may want to practice. I've been doing this for a while. I'm, I think I'm getting better at it. It's, uh, I'm calling it a here I am, Lord, prayer. And every once in a while, I'll just do this. And it's, by the way, Old Testament, there's different settings where a, a, an individual will pray, here I am, Lord. Um, New Testament, guy named Ananias, God speaks, and he says, here I am, Lord. So it's the idea of every once in a while just interjecting that into your day, whatever you're doing. Here I am, Lord, driving. And just 
see, you know, here, I, here I am, Lord, shopping. Here I am, Lord. This was two nights ago. Here I am, Lord, looking for my phone. <laughs> Here I am, Lord, wishing the ringer was on. <laughs> you ever been there? Here I am, Lord, wondering if I activated the find my phone app thing. It's just this, here I am, Lord, doing this thing, whatever it is. You know, here, uh, here I am, Lord. And by the way, you, it can be the here I am, Lord, feeling kind of tired. Or here I am, Lord, a little sad. Here I am, Lord, I am. Angry. Or feel lost or scared. Or here I am, Lord, I'm pumped. I'm celebrate, whatever, right? It's just this here I am, Lord. So before we finish this point, I'm going to ask you to do two things. One, you can fill in the blank and ask yourself this question. Is there an area of life I could use more involvement from God? So the first thing, you can write that in and begin to think about it. Is there an area of life that I could use more involvement from God? Think of your 167, 167 hours a week. Is there an area of life? And the other thing, and this will be a stretch for some of us, I'm going to give you, we're going to try this, a one-minute discussion time. I want you to find somebody right next to you. It can be the person you came with or just turn around and talk about this question with them. Think, is there one area of life that you're thinking, I'd like God more involved in? Does that make sense? Some of you are freaking out because you're like, wait a minute, interaction? No, I'm not. Says, what were you? You have one minute. You read Grape Road? One minute to discuss that question with the people around you. Ready? Go. One minute. Go. Almost halfway done. Let somebody else talk. One thing that comes to your mind, I need God involved in. Got 10 seconds. How's it going, Grape Road? Three, two, one. Awesome. Thanks for doing that, you guys. One more thing to help you engage a bunch with God over the next six weeks. In the seat back in front of you, one of these little wristbands should be there. That's for you. Grab that, and if you'd like, I've been wearing mine for four or five days now. And it's just a 160, it's the 167 wristband to just to remind us that God wants to be involved in our lives. If you turn it on the inside, we put the scripture in there that Jesus prayed that we would not be taken out of the world. So it's just practicing the presence of God. Okay, so the first idea was the Christian life in the real world requires settling into our present situations. I want to hit one more. Hang in there. It requires engaging in some protective measures. If you want to write out to the side, you could write down like strategies. And the basic idea is to have God, for us to be engaging with God 24-7 or the 167 hours outside of the church thing there's going to be challenges with that, and we're going to have to figure out a strategy to persevere when it gets hard. In the text, Jesus, the second half of the verse, I uh, pray that you don't take them out of the world, but then it says that you protect them from the evil one. There are challenges in the midst of trying to live a vibrant, all-day-long spiritual life. Uh, a side note, 
the, the word evil one here, I'm not sure why translators, they're probably right because a bunch of smart people. I'm not sure why they translated it evil one. Most of the translations do. But it again is kind of a broader term. It's not the word for Satan or uh, the devil himself, which is a word like diabolos, diabolos. It is uh, this word. I think we have, it's this. And it's the toilsome, bad, evil parts of life. It, this helped me. It's the laborious trouble. It's the inevitable agonies that go along with evil. So if you connect, hang in there. If you connect that with this idea of cosmos, the systems, I think what it's saying is, Lord, protect them from the inevitable agonies that just are going to happen in this life. Because we all, can we all agree, at least sort of, the world system is not perfect and it's broken. And by nature, you go through any day, maybe you can make it through a day, you go through any week, and there's those struggles that are like, Gah! kind of, a, let me give you an example. A month ago, maybe a little over a month ago, I took three, three days to do something that's kind of enjoyable, enjoyable, but it's a lot of work for me. I was supposed to plan this year's preaching and teaching calendar, okay, this year, 2020. And so I went away, and I've been thinking, but I decided, okay, I've been thinking about this, pondering this, and I, I minimally I had five hours, but it was probably more like seven, eight, of just screen time trying to plan sermon topics and talks, and it was in, like, with what kind of classes, and, you know, so this for me is a big deal. I have to go away by myself. I'm alone. It's not a ton, and so I'm like, okay, so the first week we'll do this, and I'm finding scriptures, and I did all that stuff, and I had all this on a piece of paper, and it worked really hard, and I went to bed. I got up the next morning, and I went to pull up my I had, I had tentatively planned from January through August. And I got up, and I started looking for my document, and it was gone. And, and by the way, I'm kind of an idiot, but not that much. I was saving the whole time. Because, you know, I've been down somewhere because I was a Google Docs. or so, I, I, It was gone. I called... Joel, guy on staff, because he knows a lot about computers. And I'm Joel. <laughs> and so he said, well, you try this and you can try that. I tried all of this. Let's go. And in that moment, if Joel had asked me, Mark, do you believe in God? <laughs> I would have said, no. <laughs> there is no God. I don't believe he's, I don't believe God. Do you believe he's good? No, I do not believe he's good. I think that this is a horrible, mean trick to play on somebody, and I'm not even sure he exists. Does that make sense? I'm like, I am done. Mark, you still want to be in ministry? No, I don't. <laughs> I'm going to go be a greeter at Walmart. Thank you very much. Because I will never, I didn't but like all that stuff. So luckily, because of, you know, life and an hour and a half, two hours later, I became a Christian again. And... <laughs> But I'll tell you, there's stuff like that, that that is just part of the broken system that every once in a while it'll happen. And by the way, you will go through something, chances are, some of us in the next six weeks or this week, it's a lot worse than just losing some documents. Just hard stuff that will make you go, is he here? Does he care? And so part of the idea for the next six weeks is to... We're going to have to have a strategy to get us through those times. Uh, you can write this in. Jesus knew the real world would be very difficult, so he prayed to the Father for divine help. Jesus knew the real world would be very difficult, so he prayed to the Father for divine help. For us! For you and I. Just a note, next week, 
just regarding this uh, spiritual battle that we will be in if we fully engage with God. The topic next week is battle ready. I'm going to try to talk, I'm, I'm going to be teaching on a spiritual posture for everyday life. How do you get through everyday life? I, I hope, I'll work really hard, I hope I won't lose the document as I'm working on it, and, and uh, but that I think it'll be really applicable. Good for you. Great time to invite a friend because how many know all of our friends are dealing with the same stuff we're dealing with? Invite them to church. Might change a life. Um, we're about ready to close. Let me give you just one more thing that might help you. A couple things. When you came in the auditorium, uh, you received a card. You should have received a card. Every week for the next five or six weeks while we're doing the series, we're going to be handing out these uh, 167 uh, challenge cards. And basically, it gives us an assignment every day, if you'd like to participate, to help us be engaging with God. I thought this was a phenomenal idea. And you can do it with the card. We'll pass them out every week. The other thing is, I think this is really cool, you can text right now, you can grab your phone and text 167 to that number, and that will sign you up for the next six weeks. Every, or every morning, you'll get a, hey, here's an idea for today to keep God in the midst of your regular day life. Uh, and I think that number, is the number on here? Yes, the text reminders is on here too, so you don't have to get that done right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. I can use this. I need help, and I want God to be part of my everyday life, and so... There we go. Why don't you stand? We're going to pray.